So today we're going to talk about sleeping COVID-19. I do want to make sure that everyone knows that I'm recording this in April 2021. And a lot of the work that I'm talking about during this time in this presentation is all really preliminary work on the pandemic and sleep habits and patterns. And I want to make sure that you guys know that research gives us more information. And the more we research what goes on during the pandemic and what went on during the special sort of focal lockdown period of the pandemic may change as we take more of that information and analyze it uh, later on. So although this is relevant right now and how we think things are, it is subject to change based on more research that we have in the future. So what's really interesting is during the pandemic, there was quite a bit of talk from sleep uh, experts about what you can do during the lockdowns, during the quarantine and isolation period to help your sleep patterns. Um, uh, sleep experts really did their best to try to educate people on what they can do during these processes because there was such big changes to a lot of people's schedules. And so <clears throat> what's really interesting, and for my students who are uh, reading the articles that are associated with this material, you'll find that there is an inverse, ar inverse article that was included um, where one of the experts that was asked for the... Um, for advice was was actually me. And so I'm one of the um, experts that was th that was interviewed to ask what are some of the things that people can do during this pandemic period to improve their sleep. A lot of the preliminary reports were coming out that people sleep were impacted by the change in schedule and the stress and everything going along with the pandemic. So here are some of the major tips. So of course, one of the biggest ones is stay on a schedule. Um, we know that during the pandemic, a lot of schedule changes happened. This could have been because maybe you were unemployed, maybe you were uh, your work schedule changed, you were working from home, uh, school schedules changed. There's a lot of things that happened that took you off of your normal schedule. So one major piece of advice was to stay on a schedule. So let's say you don't have to be up by 7 a.m. Go ahead and get up at 7 a.m. anyway. Make sure you get plenty of sunlight early in the morning within 30 minutes of waking. Um, try to keep your meals on schedule. Try to go to bed at a normal time and keep that schedule consistent throughout the week. We found that a lot of times people anecdotally were reporting that they just didn't, they felt like time really didn't have a meaning. They didn't have to be anywhere. They didn't have to commute anywhere. Um, they could sort of do their work perhaps anytime that they want. And there was a lot of issues with separating um, home and work. And so some people say, oh, I'm working from home, while others say, I'm, I'm homing from work. And so this kind of separation um, between the two uh, it blurred the lines. And so staying on a schedule and saying, no, I'm only going to work during these hours and I'm only going to go to sleep and during these hours and I'm going to, you know, uh, have my screen time during this, this time, that was really helpful to help people stay in, in rhythm and their circadian rhythm stay on track. Another thing that <clears throat> uh, expert advice was given was to avoid caffeine. And many of you, uh, especially if those of you who have really read through the, the sleep hygiene lectures knows that this is just simple sleep hygiene advice. Don't drink caffeine or consume caffeine late at night. Um, if you're going to consume caffeine, let it be earlier in the day. My own research with students on campus have shown that it's actually more of the time of day that you consume caffeine in terms of college students than how much you consume. Um, people tend to not realize how much caffeine is in things like medication um, and uh, pre and post workouts tends to be really high doses of caffeine. So if you work out uh, and exercise during the night uh, or in the evening and you're taking pre and post workouts, you could actually be uh, impacting your sleep later that evening because you've given yourself a really big boost of, of caffeine. And along with those lines, exercise. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of study trying to figure out what is the right optimal time to exercise. And really it comes down to, to, to what fits for you. So if you feel like 
you know, exercising in the evening eases you and puts you to sleep and relaxes you, uh, maybe that's the time that you'll want to exercise if you want to have a better night's rest. If exercise really kind of pumps you up and, and wakens you up and it gets you sort of, um, you know, really activated, then you probably want to reserve your exercise time for the morning to give you that extra boost. And if you exercise in the evening and you're like that, then you're probably going to have trouble falling asleep. Another major thing is screen time. Always avoid uh, laptops and tablets and phones, um, all of those screens which emit blue light in the evening. Now, there are, of course, filters that you can put on your phone and your tablet, uh, um, lots of different ones that are already built in and ones that you can get outside of that uh, that are timed automatically and your screen kind of turns this amber color. You could also get blue light blocking glasses that are true blue light blocking glasses that have amber lenses. Um, for example, Blue Blockers uh, is, is a company that actually sells the, the blue uh, light blocking glasses. Um, you want to get blue light during the day. So you don't want to wear any kind of um, lens or anything that blocks blue light during the day because the whole point of getting sunlight is to get full spectrum light. Part of that full spectrum is blue light. So you want light during the day to tell your brain, hey, it's a, I'm, I need to be awake. Um, you know, uh, I need to be alert right now. And then as the, the evening progresses and the sun goes down, that's when you should really stop being exposed to blue light and other spectrums of light. So <clears throat> there's a lot of ways that you can um, avoid uh, avoid blue light without avoiding screens. And that would be wearing the blue light blocking glasses or using some kind of filter on your screen. The best thing really is to put the screens down in the evening, especially close to bed. Um, so <clears throat> when we talk about the research that was done uh, during the pandemic, we're always going to need to be very, very careful about how we talk about the data that were collected and the results that we get from that data. So <clears throat> one major thing that happened during the pandemic is a major halt on human subjects research. That means that many facilities, universities, research places, all or research institutions, all did a sort of a halt on bringing people in for um, for some kinds of research. So there were, of course, some some medical research that was continued. Um, there were a, a lot, a lot, a lot of studies that were placed on halt because it wasn't safe to maintain uh, social distancing when you are having people do certain kinds of testing or if you're having them, for example, come in for a sleep study. Um, these are different things that uh, affected the kinds of research that were done during the pandemic. There was a really heavy reliance on survey work. Um, some of the some of the best studies that have come out so far, um, looking at the the really critical lockdown periods in the beginning of the lockdown periods, were survey work, but were comparison because they were already collecting data. I'm going to give you a, a few examples of these of. Um, data that were collected right before the pandemic happened. And then because the study was survey-based, they were able to just continue the study and then use the pre-pandemic information as sort of a baseline. What was going on right before the pandemic and then compare that to what was happening during the lockdowns and pandemic period. So those are some of the really, really great studies that we can actually do a, a, a sort of a, a a pre-post comparison of what kinds of sleep patterns were changing. However, whenever you do have survey work, it is always, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of subjectivity into it. Um, and you have a, a really heavy reliance on having people tell the truth and try to remember the best that they can. Um, we always want to do objective sleep measurement when, when possible, doing things like actigraphy and polysomnography in order to make sure that we really get solid data that is not subjective. Um, we found that there was a really big burst of support, of financial support and funding support from the government and a lot of institutions um, for any sort of COVID-related research. So we're going to see a lot of research being published in the next couple of years that were done specifically during the pandemic period um, because there was this sort of race to, to, to get this funding. Um, <clears throat> there were lots of, of, of calls that went out of looking at 
anything to do with COVID. So there is a lot of, of, of work being done and currently being done and a lot of that work in being, uh, being in the sleep field. Um, so we're going to see a lot more papers published and a lot more studies published um, soon to be able to compare across the board to see what are the patterns that we saw. And these studies are worldwide. So we're seeing papers come in from China. We're seeing papers come in from Italy and from the U.S. and all these areas where we saw the lockdown happen really early on. But one thing that we have to remember is of all of this research, a lot of it's survey work, which is, is good, but still there's always caveats with that. And it's really difficult to be able to narrow down one specific cause of something happening. So a lot of this work is going to end up being correlational. So if we take, for example, a group of people and we say, oh, they slept more, okay, during the pandemic time, and now they're depressed, we can't say that the sleep necessarily caused the depression because they're going through a pandemic. You know, they're, they're going through social, social isolation. It's a lockdown. You can't uh, visit friends and family. Um, there's a lot of loneliness aspects there. And so a lot of these changes that we see happening could actually be the reason why the person feels the way that they do. So it could be lifestyle changes and the stress that goes along with that. So um, if you were employed and are no longer employed or you are employed, but you're not getting paid or you're like, for example, uh, one of the millions of restaurant workers who had to sort of halt because uh, uh, the, the in dining um, lockdown uh, recommendation said that they that you weren't allowed to work, um, you know, in, in an actual restaurant, you couldn't come in and sit in and eat. So a lot of people might have been furloughed or laid off or even fired. And so people lost their jobs or their employment changed maybe from full-time to part-time. Um, schedules changed. People weren't commuting to work. Um, these lifestyle changes could impact how a person feels um, in terms of their mental health. A lot of people during the pandemic were experiencing a lot of anxiety and depression and loneliness, but we don't know, is it because that they had a change in their sleep patterns or is it because uh, their depression is the reason why they changed their sleep patterns? So we don't really know. We know that the relationships are really, really intertangled. So it's going to be really hard to tease apart exactly what's causing what. What it could be is the pandemic's causing all of it. It's causing the the stress and the worry. Um, a lot of people were experiencing a lot of financial stress, not knowing if they lost their job, not knowing where their income's coming from. They can't pay their bills. There were a lot of um, sort of uh, unknowns during the time if uh, people were going to get kicked out of their houses. Um, caregiving responsibilities changed. People were uh, losing daycares and having to, to care for their children, uh, perhaps while also working or caregiving giving for an older adult. And there were, there was a lot of worry and fear that people were experiencing during this time that all contributed to the stress, which can impact mental health and the lifestyle changes can factor into both of those. And then finally, we had this sort of new normal, right? So there's all these new behaviors we had to learn. And, you know, if you go to a store, you had to wear a mask and you had to remain six feet, you know, apart and you couldn't go down every single aisle. There were a lot of new rules um, and we had really no timeline. So we had this idea of like, okay, well, uh, you know, in 12 weeks, it's all going to be back to normal, right? So, um, and then, you know, 12 weeks pass and it's like, okay, you know, six more weeks. And so um, there's a, still this feeling of this sort of new normal and when is it going to get back to the pre-pandemic period? And that, of course, is causing a lot of really major um, issues kind of factoring into, okay, I have this lifestyle change. Is this going to be permanent? Is this going to be something that is, you know, my new my new normal? If, they, if a person lost their job, you know, am I going to be able to be em employed? There's a lot of uncertainty that contributed to a lot of the mental health issues that were going around um, during the pandemic and still continuing today. Um, so let's talk specifically about what were the sleep issues that were reported during the pandemic. Now I've given you guys several studies to look at, and you're going to find that there are some common threads across the studies, but the interesting thing is that we really don't know, uh, yet exactly what's happening. There's a lot of conflicting evidence in terms of what 
people experience. And I think what we're going to end up finding is that a lot of these sleep issues that we're, that are, that we're going to find, um, are going to be sort of categorized based on different types of, of, of populations of people. So I think that we're going to, to really, uh, in the next couple of years, find that meant, um, so like healthcare workers might be one category that were affected a certain way. Um, you know, working parents who lost, you know, their, their daycare and their, um, their, their child care might have been affected a certain way. We're going to find <clears throat> these pockets. And I think that's the reason why we're seeing a lot of conflicting uh, evidence right now, where some people sleep in improved and then some people sleep didn't. Um, but let's look at the common thread. So one thing that we see in, in a lot of the studies is that time in bed increased, okay? So people were going to bed and staying in bed longer. So not necessarily, so time in bed and sleep duration are two different things, right? So time in bed is just how long you're sitting in bed. So you could be on your phone, you could be on your laptop, you can watch TV. These are all things that you're just physically doing in the bed, but you're not sleeping, okay? But we did find that people spent more time in bed, but they also slept longer. So sleep duration was increased during this time. And so they, the, the studies that are out there are uh, contradictory in terms of how much extra sleep people were getting. So it ranges anywhere from, for example, three minutes to 20 minutes. There's a lot of conflicting evidence there as to how much extra sleep people got, but it is trending toward people spending more time in bed and actually physically getting more sleep. Another really interesting trend is that people uh, seem to experience a lot more vivid dreams. They could recall their dreams. Now, this could be caused by stress. It could be caused by the fragmentation that was um, occurring uh, during the sleep periods. So here we see the, de the decreased side, decreased sleep quality. These are, um, for example, sleep fragmentation. People were waking up. They just didn't feel rested in the morning. Their whole quality of sleep decreased. And so we can explain the dreams by either it could be, or it could be a combination of stress. Um, it could be that people were uh, experiencing more REM episodes, so rapid eye movement um, periods of sleep. And when, you know, we know that your vivid dreaming really occurs during this period of sleep and if you're getting more rapid eye movement sleep, then the idea is, is that you're going to dream more. Um, if your sleep is fragmented and you're waking up a lot during the night because maybe you can't get comfortable or you are having issues um, with staying asleep, um, maybe it's stress related, maybe um, it's your environment, maybe, you know, you're sharing space with people that you don't normally share space with, um, or maybe you're not sharing space and that's affecting you. Um, waking up a lot during the night means that you're probably going to wake during a REM episode and be more likely to recall the dream. So it could be that you're not actually dreaming more, but you're just recalling the dream because you're waking up right after it. Um, and this, you know, decrease in sleep quality um, <clears throat> is, is really important because this is a potential explanation for a lot of what's going on. So even though you would expect, okay, somebody uh, got more sleep, that means that they should feel more rested. That's not necessarily the case. What really it boils down to is if you're having poor sleep quality, whether it's, you know, six hours, four hours, or 12 hours of sleep, if the quality is bad, then we know that you're not going to feel as rested. So some of the studies that I had you guys look at really talked about a lot of these things that, that I've talked about here today. But one thing that I really want to bring your attention to is this really interesting letter to the editor. And this is um, a paper that was written um, uh, as an explanation, a potential explanation for the increased dream recall that was discovered during some uh, uh, individuals in during the pandemic. And so the idea is that um, what we find during sleep extension is that people tend to uh, when they get more sleep or, or they attempt to get more sleep, a lot of times they, they tend to um, have that fragmented sleep. Um, and so this was something that I was really interested in, actually did my dissertation on is looking at sleep extension um, and trying to see if it is true that when you extend your sleep, if that actually does um, lead to more fragmented sleep. And so there's still some preliminary results there, but it's a really interesting theory as to why people are dreaming more. And 
I would have to say that I think that this is a really interesting idea. And I, and I do think that this is a really good explanation for why people were, were experiencing, um, more vivid dreams and recalling more vivid dreams. Um, so along the lines of, of some other things that were found during the, the course of the pandemic research so far, um, is that people uh, were uh, going to bed later and waking up later. Um, that kind of factored into this increased sleep duration, increased uh, time in bed. Um, you know, if you look back to your own habits during that time, you didn't maybe need to be anywhere in the morning. So your bedtime didn't really matter. Your wake time might not have really had to matter anyway, because you didn't have to commute. You could sleep in. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, maybe you were watching a lot of TV and playing on your phone a lot because you weren't able to do other things. Um, and so people just say, oh, well, I have nothing else to do. So I'm just going to get in bed and, um, look on my phone. And so you might have actually experienced some of this. Um, so it's interesting to see what kind of anecdotally you might be able to relate to, to some of this work. So I'm really interested in hearing about that. And if you want to kind of comment on some of the things that you experienced and, and if you think that a lot of people tended to perhaps get poor sleep quality, but spend more time in bed. I'm really interested in that as well. If you have any questions, you know, you can email me and hopefully you got something out of today's lecture.